Well, good morning again, everyone, and it is good to see you here. And uh, welcome, welcome to those of you joining online. And I just want to say, too, for those online that haven't been back to Woodside during the pandemic, uh, that you are missed here, and we look forward to see, seeing you, hopefully, in the not-too-distant future. Well, the pandemic has been very tough. These past two years have been very difficult. Many of us have stories or know someone with stories about the loss of a loved one or someone lost their job or someone's job has changed and they don't like it so much anymore. And then there's the stories about children missing school and missing participating in events. It's been a very difficult year. Some people have said, do you remember this? 2020 was the worst year ever. And then 2020 was the worst year ever. And here we are in 2022. And uh, studies show that when it comes to grief, fear, anxiety, anger, and the sense of isolation, that they're at all-time highs. There's a sense in many homes, in many individuals, just a sense of heaviness and hopelessness. I want to ask you today, do you have that sense of hopelessness? where you're so down. Well, today, as we continue in our series, Family Treasures, we're going to talk about the gift of perseverance, the gift of being able to keep going even when you feel like giving up, the gift of being resilient so that you can bounce back from setbacks, the faith that says, I will continue to trust in God even in the face of adversity and change, that you would have that and then be able to pass it to your children, if you have children, and to other people. It's God's will for you and for me that we persevere in the Christian faith, that we're able to bounce back. So that's what we're looking at today. Some of you may be familiar with uh, a statement that Paul makes. It's found in Romans 8 where he says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. That if you belong to Jesus, you are more than a conqueror in your relationship with Jesus. Apart from Jesus, we are not conquerors. We can look in the mirror and say, I can... I can defeat cancer, I can face this, nobody's stopping me, I'm just going to think all of these thoughts. But at the end of the day, apart from Jesus, we die. Or we could say, as sometimes still is resonating in our culture, the universe has my back. Do you remember the secret? Just send out positive vibes out into the universe and you'll attract positive things in your life. You can send out all the positive vibes you want, but at the end of the day, you're not an overcomer. You're going to die. Sin and death wins. But with Christ, there is victory. He overcame. And because you belong to him, you are more than a conqueror. So that's what we're looking at today. And before we begin, I want you to know that if you are going to become a strong person, strong in your faith, resilient, you persevere. So much is connected to the way you think. Resilient people, studies show this, think differently than non-resilient people. The way they think enables them to manage stress, enables them to get back up and keep going. So in other words, your mind matters. Okay, if we didn't have our masks on, I'd ask you to turn, to turn to somebody and just say, your mind matters. Your mind matters. Now, we're not saying that every struggle that we have and face in life is all in the mind. But what we are saying is that the mind is the battlefield of your life. And most of the struggles are in your mind. What happens in your mind what thoughts you think is very, they're very important. So before I begin to, I want to make uh, us aware of this, that sometimes we get so stuck in our thoughts 
and these thought processes, and it takes, you know, we've been in them for years, and we try to get out of this thinking, uh, and our feelings are so tangled up with our thinking. Sometimes we're so stuck that we can't get out by ourselves, and sometimes there is a place for medication to stabilize us to start to think constructively. And sometimes we need help. We need to go to a counselor, a Christian counselor, and get help so that they can help us to get out of those thought processes. So I wanna encourage you, if you are stuck, to reach out and get the help you need. Don't be embarrassed about it, don't be ashamed about it, because God's called you to be more than a conqueror, so you want to, to be able to move in a different, with different thought patterns. So we're looking at three things that you need to be thinking about as you journey through life that will help you to be an overcomer. So that's what we're going to do today. We're going to look at Romans 8, this glorious passage. If you have a Bible, I invite you to turn there. And then we're going to look at some hopeful ideas for imperfect families and parents. I want to say that your children are assaulted every single day with many lies in our culture. And uh, if your child is going to be resilient and an overcomer, it's going to take work. It's a battle. It's a spiritual battle. So how can you become a stronger person? How can your kids become stronger? Number one, think position. It is so important to think about who you are as you go through life, to remind yourself over and over again. Paul in Romans 8 says this, those who are in Christ Jesus, he's talking to Christians, those that are in Christ Jesus. When you read your Bible, Paul again and again talks about us being in Christ, our union with Christ, we have a relationship with Christ, we belong to Christ, we're in Christ Jesus. Over and over again to all the different churches, here to the church at Rome, you're in Christ Jesus. He also, in Romans 8, talks about them being God's children. In Christ, you're part of a family and you're God's children. And in this chapter, he talks about brothers and sisters. He talks about calling God Abba Father, a term of intimacy and connection. And then he also says that, that they are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. That's who they are. That's who you are. As you journey through life, you're not journeying through life thinking the thought process is, I'm all alone me against the world, me against the universe, but rather, I've got Jesus. I belong to Jesus. I'm in Jesus. As you journey through life, you have an adversary who wants you to live in defeat. He wants to rob you of joy and peace and hope. And where does he most often attack? In the mind. He often starts in the mind because he knows if he can win the battle in your mind, he can defeat you. He wants to get your mind off of the fact that you belong to God and that Jesus is real, and he wants to get your mind onto your circumstances and what that person did to you and how hurt you feel and what you did and how you failed. So you've got to choose to think that I belong to Jesus. I have to think and remind myself of my position. Did you know that you can't always control every thought that shows up in your mind? but you can control which thoughts you're gonna entertain. So choose these thoughts about God. Paul goes on in Romans 8 and verses five and six and says this. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. You have a choice of what you're going to set your mind on. You can set it on the flesh. And when you read scripture, the flesh sometimes refers to your physical body, but sometimes it refers to your spiritual nature. Here, it's your spiritual nature. He's talking about the sinful nature, the fallen nature. You can set your mind on the sinful nature and the desires of the sinful nature, or you can set your mind on the spirit on God, on the things of God. If you set your mind on your fallen nature, the result is death, it's ruin. If you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, things of God, it will lead to life and peace. So we all choose 
what we're going to entertain, what we're going to bring up in our minds again and again. So again, I wanted to say, your mind matters. It is critical what you're thinking about. And research shows that many of the problems that we have are related to wrong thought processes. A lot of interpersonal conflict, relational conflict, wrong thought processes. We have something in our brain uh, that happens. We call them neural pathways, that when you think a thought, that thought creates a pathway or a pattern. And if you think that thought again, it gets easier each time you think that thought and you're creating a pathway. So for example, if tomorrow you got up and you had to go to work or to school, you had to cross a field, uh, okay, we're here in Canada and the field's knee high, uh, waist high in snow, everybody got it, the picture? And you're crossing a field to, you know, to go to work or to school or to grandma, grandmother's house we go, okay, you're going across that field. The first time you go across, you've got to wade through the snow. But if the next day, you take the same path, it gets a bit easier. 21 days in a row, it's a little easier to take. Every time you think a thought, you're creating a neural pathway in your brain, and it's easy. And the challenge for us is we still have sin natures, and a lot of us uh, sinful patterns, that we've created these pathways that are very easy to walk on. A new creation, a new Christian, begins to think a different way. Instead of setting their minds on the things of their fallen nature, they're setting their minds on God, and they have to start to think a different way. And it takes time. It takes effort. You used to think money was all mine. I used to spend it all on myself or my family. Oh, now I need to think this way about money. I used to think this way about my time. And just for years, I did it this way. Now I have to think this way about my time. I used to think about my problems this way and felt this way. Now I need to think about my problems this way. Scripture teaches that as we think in our minds, so we are. In other words, when we bring stuff into our minds and we think about it, it tends to get lived out. That our strongest thoughts tend to move us in a certain direction. So, are your thoughts on God and who you are? Or are they, are they on something else? So think, position. I belong to Jesus. Second, think perspective. Think perspective. As you journey through life, I belong to Jesus. But then, you're reminding yourself that Jesus has overcome the world and so that affects how I see things, how I interpret things. Paul says this in verses 18 and 19, he, he, there's so much perspective in this chapter, Romans chapter 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. If you're considering becoming a Christian and saying, hey, I might put my faith in Jesus. Please understand this, that that does not, your relationship with Jesus does not exempt you from suffering. Jesus doesn't put it in the fine print. He puts it right in. You will suffer if you follow me. You live in a fallen world. In fact, we know that if we follow Christ, we have, may have increased suffering. You look around the world today, there are Christians. We're the most persecuted group. Uh, uh, in the world, and there are Christians around the world who are suffering. Today in our culture, we'll be talking about this in a few weeks, about uh, truth and, and free speech and all that, but, but we may see more suffering coming our way. We're not sure. But the reality is, you will suffer. In this world, Jesus said, you will have trouble. Paul says, these sufferings, and notice he calls them present sufferings, to the church at Corinth, he calls them light and momentary. And Paul has been through a lot. How can you call that, them light and momentary? Because he's comparing them to the glory that will be revealed in us. What's Paul doing there? He's taking everything he's going through, a traffic accident, trauma, 
uh, uh, health diagnosis. He's taking everything that's happening and he's putting it into a context, into an eternal context. These sufferings, present sufferings, they're, it's not always going to be this way. Think with an eternal view. There's coming a day of glory. What you're going through is temporary. Jesus said, in this world you have trouble, but take heart, be strong, persevere, get back up. Why? Because Jesus says, I have conquered the world. How has Jesus conquered the world? He died on the cross for our sins, was buried, rose again the third day, is alive today, coming back, will set all things right and make all things new. So in light of that reality, put your suffering in an eternal con context. There's a day coming, it says, Creation awaits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. There's a day coming when you, just an ordinary follower of Jesus, are going to be revealed that you are spectacular as a child of God. Do you want to turn to somebody and say, there's a day coming. People are going to know you are spectacular in Christ. That's the sense there, glory. Paul goes on, verses 22 and 23. We know that the whole creation, he's talking about the fallen creation, our world that things just aren't right. We know that the fall, whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. Notice there, Paul says, as we're going through life, we're groaning. Things are not right. We sometimes feel bad. But at the same time we're feeling bad, we have this eager expectation, we're excited because we're looking forward to the day of our adoption. It's talking about salvation. There's a past, present, and future tense to our salvation. The, the already but not yet. Paul says we're already in God's family, but the day that it'll be fully realized is coming. We're looking forward to that day when we're his children, it will be revealed. We're looking to forward to that day when we will have new glorified bodies, bodies that have been redeemed. So Paul says, we've got this pain and sorrow, but we also have this joy and expectation. And I just want to talk for a moment just about feelings in the Christian life. If you're a new Christian, maybe you've seen this diagram uh, it's the diagram of uh, fact, faith, and feelings, uh, the train analogy. That as a new Christian, or as a Christian, that facts are to be driving your life. The Christian faith is all about critical thinking. What's true, what's not true, what's facts? Physical laws, spiritual laws, we're about facts. We're about truth. All truth is God's truth. So truth or facts are to be driving my life, not my feelings. Notice the feelings, that's the caboose. However, we don't disregard our feelings because our feelings are always telling us something. So as I set my mind on the truth and I reframe things, it doesn't mean that I brush aside my feelings. Feelings matter. Now again, going through uh, life, there's times when we can feel conflicted. If you've lost a loved one, you can say, you know what, my loved one, I, you know, I believe is with Jesus and isn't suffering anymore, and, and you just have that, that peace and joy. But on the other hand, you grieve and you still miss them. So our feelings matter, but they need to be placed in the right context. So it's okay to feel bad, but we realize feelings are not driving us, but rather facts are driving us. Feelings driving us, what does it look like? One day we're up, next day we're down. Anybody else, you're like, oh my goodness, God just answered this prayer. Oh, I love you, Jesus, you know, I just wanna pray every day. And then just shortly thereafter, you're like, I don't know if God ever hears my prayers. Does God even care about me? We're just up and down and all around. Our feelings, so many things come into play. We're complex individuals, right? Sometimes I feel negative and down. Why? Because my blood sugar's low. I could just use a, a meal, something to eat. Or it's because I, I'm tired and I could just use a good night's rest. So your feelings 
do not drive your life. I'm just going to live out however I feel. No, I'm going to live out truth, God's word. So when there's a disconnect between fact and feeling, it's an opportunity for me to exercise, notice in the middle, faith. I feel this way, but I'm going to believe what God says. So for an example, a person that says, you know what, I really don't think that God could forgive me for what I did. It affected these people, and I just can't seem to let it go. I don't think God could forgive me. I don't feel he can. That's feeling. What's God's word say? What's truth? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So fact, feeling. Faith says, I feel this way, but God, I'm going to trust you that you have forgiven my sins. And your faith in time begins to grow. You're you're starting a new neural pathway in your brain. I don't think God can use me. I'm no good. Is that the truth? No, it's not. Uh, I think I'm worthless. Is that the truth? No, it's not. And it's creating these neural pathways that are set on God and his truth. We're reframing. God's truth always supersedes our feelings. We can't control always what happens to us, but we can control how we frame it, how we put it into perspective. What is interesting is Paul not only taught this, but he lived it. Paul writes this letter to the Romans in AD 57, and he's writing and he's saying, you know what, I long to see you guys. He had never met these Christians in Rome, and he wanted to go to Rome because it was a strategic city in the Roman Empire, and uh, he's planning to go to Spain, and he wanted to go to Rome. So he writes in AD 57, he says, I just long to go to Rome and share the gospel there and see you guys. And guess what? Three years later, his dream comes true. But he's not there as a tourist preaching the, gospels, the gospel in the streets of Rome. He's been arrested, appeals to Caesar. He's in Rome as a prisoner in chains under house arrest, waiting for his trial before the emperor, a possible execution. And while Paul is there, he writes what we call the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. And it's interesting, in the letter to the Philippians, he, after he greets them, he says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, what has happened to me. I just want you to let you know that things did not turn out the way that I dreamed. I had a bucket list of coming to see you guys and meeting you, but I was arrested and it was just horrible. It was horrific. Everything's just a mess. And then he goes on in Philippians 1 to say, as a result of this mess, um, I can't go to life group anymore. I'm chained up. I'm quitting church. I'm not going there anymore. God didn't answer my prayer. I mean, I can just give you 20 different prayers that I prayed. The thorn in the flesh. You know, we had a shipwreck. He just, he just didn't answer this prayer, this prayer. I'm, I'm quitting the, the Christian faith. Philippians 1 doesn't say that. Why? Because Paul took his arrest and everything he went through and he reframed it and put it in the perspective of eternity. That he was connected to Jesus, he belonged to Jesus, and Jesus had conquered sin and death. Jesus was in control. So, even in the midst of this tragedy or this very difficult situation, his thoughts were on Jesus. And he shares with the Philippians, what I want you to know, brothers and sisters, is that even all this has happened, the gospel, the good news about Jesus, it's still advancing. I got a guard. Every eight hours they they shift another one. I get to preach to him for eight hours. It's great. And then he'll share it. And as a result of that, the other Christians in Rome, they're more bold in their faith. It's called reframing. And Paul does it again and again, even in Romans 8, you see him reframing. And he says to these Christians in Rome, hey, you're going to face opposition, but God is for you. When you know, someone doesn't like you or someone in your family thinks you're crazy because you're a Christian or your job is pers- he's, your boss is at your, you know, on you because you're a Christian, listen, reframe it. Look what he says in verse uh, 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, 
Who can be against us? If the God of the universe, you're in his family, you belong to him, who are you going to fear? Yeah, you're going to be a little nervous, maybe with a boss, or a little nervous, hey, if you're going for an interview for a job, but you've got to put that in the right context. Okay, I'm nervous, but I'm not going to be intimidated. I'm not going to panic because I'm reframing. God is with me. Again, the more and more you can do that through life, the easier you can get to that place. Paul says in verse 32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Paul, again, God's for you. Put it in that context. He not only protects you, he provides for you. You might think you're missing out on the Christian life, but God is a giver. He's gracious. You will get your gifts. Put it in the right context. And then verse 33, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. When you fail, the fact is God has declared you righteous and you or the accuser or someone might say, no, God can't forgive you of that sin. Put it in the right context. God justifies. If you and your children are going to become stronger, ongoing practice, your ongoing practice needs to be reframing. I know in our house, we do that all the time. Something happens at school, kind of bring God into the equation again and again, getting perspective. So think position, think perspective. Lastly, think promises. And this is imperative for us all, but especially if you're an overthinker and you want to become an overcomer, you really need to grasp and hold on to the promises of God. If you constantly kind of look back and you're always, if only, if only, if only, and you catastrophize, or you constantly look forward and you're what if, what if, what if, and you catastrophize, if you're going to get from those neural pathways to another one, you've got to again and again bring to mind the promises of God. In Romans 8, there's a number of promises, but there's three big ones. Right at the beginning, there's a promise of no condemnation for us. At the end, there's a promise of no separation of God's love uh, for us. And then in the middle, there's one that has helped Christians down through the ages. So let's begin with the first promise. Paul writes, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As you go through life, do you remind yourself of that? There's no condemnation. Condemnation is the flip side of justification. Justification is I'm declared right because of what Jesus did for me on the cross. Condemnation is I'll never pay or be judged for the sins I've done. And this is so important, especially if you're a new Christian. This is so important to grasp. As God's child, his beloved son or daughter, God never punishes you when you do wrong. Why? Because God took all of your sins, Colossians 2, took all of your sins and placed them on Jesus, and Jesus experienced the punishment for your sins. God, your Father, disciplines you, but doesn't punish you. Punishment has to do with the penalty for something in the past. Discipline has to do about correction for the future. God wants you to grow, so he's going to correct you, he's going to discipline you, but he doesn't punish you. He doesn't I'm going to get you back. That's not your Father. When you receive Christ as your Savior and Lord, whether you know the date and time or you just know the period in your life where you put your faith in Jesus, the moment you did that, God saw your heart. The Holy Spirit comes into you. You were what we call regenerated. But at that moment, there was an exchange. And all of your sins that you would ever commit, past, present, and the ones you're going to commit in the future, they were all put on Jesus on the cross. He was given your sins. And his righteousness, his perfect life, his robe of righteousness was put on you. So when your father sees you, he does not see your sin. You're holy and blameless. You're clothed in the righteousness of Christ. You're in Christ. There's no condemnation. If God was to punish Jesus or punish Jesus for your sins on the cross, and then he took those same sins and he then punished you for them, it would be double punishment, double jeopardy, and God can't do that 
because he is just. And so we, as we journey through life, we sing with the hymn writer, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. God is a God who is holy, and he has to judge sin. What's happening in Afghanistan today with men and women and girls because of particular leadership? What's happening around our world? There is so much evil. God is holy. He he can't turn the other cheek and say, hey, well, tough luck, wrong place, wrong time. He judges every single sin, big or small, yours included, but all of yours were nailed to the cross. When you begin to get that, You go through life with a hope and a future. There's ongoing confession. I'm sorry, Lord, for doing that. In your relationship, you want to stay close. But you're not fearing judgment because Jesus did it all for you. And you'll find your affection for him growing. So the first promise, Paul says, there's no condemnation. And then at the end, he says, there's no separation. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? If you gave your life to Jesus... You are in Christ. He loves you with a perfect love and eternal love. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? You ever felt that way going through persecution or hardship? Oh, do you love me anymore, Lord? As it is written, for your sake we face death death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced, and I hope you are convinced, I hope your family's convinced. Paul says, for I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That as we journey through life, we know no matter what happens to us, we're still loved. Even the times we think and we don't feel God loves us, we put it in perspective, I am loved for all eternity. And then there's a third promise in the middle of this book, and we find it in Romans 8, 28. And maybe you've said it a few times, a few hundred times, but Paul says this, and we know, we bring this to mind again and again, we know it's a fact, and we know that in all things God works Not in some things, not just in the good things, but in the bad things too, that we know in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. That the sovereign God who is controlling all things and working out his eternal plan is also involved in your life and you know that he is working for your good. His his sovereignty is connected to his goodness. There's coming a day, you know in part now, you'll know fully then, and there's coming a day, and he will explain, you see this, why this happened? You see this here? And you will say, God, you are good. And so we go through life in that confidence that even in the midst of trauma and tragedy, God still is at work. And so I begin to think that way as opposed to thinking, this is the end of the world, God doesn't love me, I'm quitting church. We think. It matters. So if you and your children are going to become stronger in the faith and face adversity and change and keep going, because there's been many Christians in the face of adversity who have continued on, you need to bring to mind again who you are. I belong to Jesus. You need to put things in perspective. Jesus has conquered everything, and I'm connected to him. I'm more than a conqueror. I know the end of the story. It's good and not bad. And then I need to think promises. Oh God, I believe in you here. I'm believing you with this rather than simply acting according to how I feel. So here's some hopeful ideas for imperfect families. Number one, become more aware of your thoughts. How many of you, you don't even think about what you're thinking about? Anybody? Okay, right? What are you thinking about? Okay, what's your son or daughter, your little child thinking about? And you say, well, how do I know? Out of the overflow of the, of the, of the heart, the mouth speaks. So a lot of times... What we're thinking about tends to get said, tends to get lived out. So can I encourage you this week that you begin that discipline of being aware of your thoughts, connected to your thoughts, your emotions. What are my emotions? 
Identifying your emotions, and then questioning your emotions, questioning your thinking. That's step two. Identify and challenge unbiblical thoughts. Again, if you've had a pathway for years where you thought, I can't, I'm just, I'll never, I'm just worthless, you have that way of thinking, you need to challenge it. And sometimes you need a counselor or someone that will help you to begin to challenge those toxic lies. Can you think of any lies in your home right now that are being thought? Number three, be intentional about making all your thoughts biblical. So here's what we're thinking. Hey, this is not true. We may feel this way, but it's not true. What's the truth? And this is where it's imperative to fill your mind with truth. The reality is, Scripture says we're in a spiritual battle. And Scripture doesn't, you know... um, Scripture normalizes it. It's just, if you want to follow the Lord, you're going to have to fight for your mind, fight for your heart. It's a battle. It is so easy. Listen, you and your kids, we're assaulted every day. It is so easy just to follow the thinking of the world. The prince of the air of this world, our adversary, just follow that thinking. Here's the truth about you. Here's the truth about God. Here's the truth... The world just says, think this way. It leads to death, to ruin. You have to fight, which means how in your family are you getting in God's word? And maybe it's just a verse at supper time. You read it quickly. The kids are climbing the walls, but you read it and you pray. Maybe it's an app where once a day you've got a verse or a passage and you just every day take a few minutes, you say it, you read it, and you just, Lord, I'm bringing this to mind. You're in a life group over and over again, just little by little, you're getting truth into your mind. And it doesn't happen overnight that we're all, all you know, set free from the lies that rob us, but in time, we can build that neural pathway, fill our minds with truth. And that's what we want to do together as a church family. Number four, surround yourself with others who have biblical thoughts. Oh, you believe that about Jesus? You believe that there really was someone in human history that rose again? Oh, you really believe all of the prophecies connected to him? Oh, you really see how this all makes sense? You need to be around other people like that. That's why it's imperative your kids are in church or in Sunday school, you're in church, that, that you're maybe in a life group or you have a prayer partner. You don't, we don't want to be in a bubble. We want to reach out to people who are believing anything and everything We don't want to be a bubble, but we need people in our life that say, hey, I know you feel this way. But here's the truth. God still loves you. Let's keep going. Will you battle for your mind? Will you battle for your children's mind? We can be overcomers through Christ who loved us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray for all the families represented here. Lord, that by the power of your living word, you would renew their minds. Lord, that you would set them free from lies that rob them of joy and peace and love and hope. And Lord, I pray for us together as a church family that we would become stronger, that we would continue to be faithful to you until that day when we see you, the day when there will be no more sin and pain and death. So Lord, work, I pray, in your name. Amen.